it's always much more complex. And uh, uh, so in that regard, it's a different, you could, one could argue, it's different and it's tied uh, to the Mongolian land, like this Vajrapani, you become a naturalized citizen of Mongolia. You know? <laughs> uh, so that, uh, again, and it's happened with not just uh, a discriminated by Mongolian identity in so many ways. I also want to add here um, the fact that we should seriously consider this is that um, out of all know that out of 1022 temples and monasteries, two were spared, right? So what Gandhan had and two that were spared. And all the Gandhan had is practice for seven decades. And after this big gap, the country is just struggling to revive its tradition. And it's a struggle of temple construction of going very smoothly. There are temples that are um, being built in Lamata and in, in countryside. But the, um, bringing back the lineages of scholars, or bringing back that knowledge, takes much more generations. More generations mm -hmm. And I think we're still in a very good process of, of observation to Indian data, right? And the study in Zara and the study in the Tibetan Sahara community. That's why the language that they study is in Tibetan. Previous conference, um, the terminology instead of Sanskrit terms is now more Tibetan terms are used. And it's because of all the struggle, but I'm sure that because of this big, big co co uh, concern of national identity, those questions will be sorted out mm -hmm. in the time. Yeah, I'm really, 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 Тэр бид тэр хүнд нэг асуудал 
Now throughout her life, his mother had prayed to Guru Tara. She had recited mantras to her and had made the best offerings to her. And when she was dying, she prepared And when she was dying, uh, she, she prepared to go to the land of the Buddhas. And she asked her son, during her life, your mother has thought to cultivate the Buddha green Tara in her heart, has spoken her name, has prayed to her with mantras. So before I finally close my eyes, finally, I would like to see her. Her son resisted, but it was his mother's earnest request. And so he unwrapped the stone, a golden, smiling, shining image of green Tara. Such is the power of mantra, of a good heart and of faith. Тэр үг бол хүний зотоор хэлчин хүчний долгоныг шингэн мэдрэхэд түүний хэлч хүчийг дээж цаг хугацаанд хязгааргүй яваа хэлчэс төвшгэлгүй үйл ажиллах тоон бүдгийн үг бол ийтэй өнгөтэй авиа чимээтэй өөрийн хурдтай хэрэгтэй сүйдэртэй бодтой өршдөг зүйл өөр хэлийн үг бол матэ юм аа ургаа модны төсөн мөчрт Мөчир нь навчинда навчин нэр шихэг эсэндээ хадгалттай ангиадлах нь хүний дотоод сэтгэл болоод хадгалдаг нь өнгө хөрштэй байна. Хүний болон санаа өгөөр хэлгэлийн хадгшаан гарахта өөрийнхөө нэрлэн бүхэл тэрхүү болон санааны хаан утгыг шингэн зоргож үлдээлттэй өчмүүлэлтэй гэн төрөлсөн болчтой байна. So words manifest the waves of power which have been absorbed within a person. They are the forces of sound which continue to bear this power even to the edges of time. They have manifest light and shade, words are material. A grove of a tree has its branches, the branches have their leaves and the leaves have their veins, and similarly in the mind and the qualities of a person are eternally stored in their words. So a person's mind is expressed in the words they use and reveals their thoughts. This physical image is never destroyed, its appearance seems good to the world. Bad words are poison darts aimed towards a fragile heart. The bad words used by the media in recent years have greatly sullied the world's purity of thought. Haradin Ugund Yutunsin Hamin Mosik Hossel Haradin Hakin Kimichime Hossuch Senior Jordan Itigate Word. Hatman Yamuch Sharsurgu Word Oyusana Turksitron Chod Uginsama Otherwise it is to fire without any concern for injury, word darts into a fragile and pure heart. Flowing tears. Such things have an effect upon the liver which as we know is the most important organ. It is said that mantras are protective, but to be involved with verbal cruelty is something quite different. Unkindness, <coughs> unkindness does not affect a person who is not disputatious, who does not himself. <laughs> Монголын нүүдчдийн яруу найрагт маш их тортой болгож яруу найрагыг одоо дээд тэмдэглэж үүдэг юм байна. Ойлгох тоо юм ойлгох гэж байна. Амсэй 
prayer to Artanowo. It's as follows. Oh my Artanowo. Oh my Artanowo. Oh my Artanowo. And <clears throat> when the pure power of many people is concentrated, the words used in recitation such as this increase in power. There is an accumulation of extraordinary charge in such words. For instance, when a horse stumbles, a herder will call on Akhtanawa. The nomads know of the powerful influence exerted by words, and so they honor poetry as being a truly divine form. <laughs> The power of genuine poets brings forth their words and it establishes a secret world. Poetry discovers its form through a collection of fine words. It stores the power of meaning which suits the form. This inner power which creates a mental form manifests outside and expands pure, form, pure thought like an atomic power. In poetry, words and rhythm and melody, at the time of production, hold in themselves a myriad of magical possibilities and open up a power to move the mind of different types of reader at different times and in different places. So a genuinely peaceful poetry increases an invisible physical power. It's a magical sphere of meaning which stimulates as much as it provokes. So uh, I will now read um, what my poem, um, which in my translation is called Song of the Moon. <laughs> I dropped into my ink the rays of the silver moon, and their quality shone with the shining picture of eternity. I wove my ra the rays of the storytelling moon onto the tip of my vision, and I sewed my poem children with a perfect silken thread. I struck the crystal of the nephrite moon onto my hardened heart, and in the darkness there streamed from my poetry rays of jade. I placed my song of grace before the mirror of the wise moon, and my poem with the shining soul dwelt in the light of Shambhala. in Ulaanbaatar, and as well as in Belgium and France. He also participated in group shows, uh, numerous group shows in Ulaanbaatar, and in Germany and in Korea. 
Since 2005, he's an assistant professor at uh, Mongol University of Art and Culture um, painting class. And since 2009, he is um, the leader of um, Young Artists Association at the Union of Mongolian Artists. Okay, please welcome and Sava. characteristics in teaching art. Two methods in doing my uh, doing my research. So I think that the tutor wants to stop the talk talk. The tutor case doesn't. So I think it should be the front to the case there. So the first part of the research is about. Uh, uh, using the Azing's temperament test, which includes 40 questions, it's a 40 questions test, and it's employed <coughs> to uh, employed in uh, doing research about the temperament of the individual. And the second uh, second step was to do the analysis analysis of the artworks of the artists. So, uh, in research, uh, participated about 200 artists from Mongolia, and because it's a, a small uh, country, small population, most of the artists knew each other and he went to them, asked them and asked them to uh, Okay, so uh, he was taking the tests and asking them to uh, draw the <coughs> Three 
so when analyzing the uh, artworks, what we can see here is that uh, sanguine choleric type of temperament. Uh, they most of them gave very abstract names like horses uh, from the skies or So, uh, uh, from what we can see from here is that the art is influenced by the individual's uh, psychological characteristics and his uh, type of temperament. And, and So the next question, how we use it in, in teaching arts. So he started uh, his next uh, phase in his research by choosing 10 uh, freshmen coming to the Art, art Institute uh, in uh, uh, determining their temperament. I produced a, a book called Golas Namathan um, and that means something like the river flows gently. Like and, and this was uh, an exposition of um, Mongolia from the point of view of poetry and from the point of view of the tradition of poetry. But it was also a young man's book looking forward. And he and Mendoyo and another poet called um, Nyamsuren and a bunch of other people got together and made a, a group which was called Gunu. And Gunu comes from, it's an acronym from Gol Uslamo Khan Right? G U N U. And Gunu uh, was uh, a movement um, to re almost to reclaim what happened before the revolution and to put it in modern terms. Um, they were influenced greatly by a poet called uh, Bexin Yawakulan, uh, who had died in 1982, at a, a reasonably young age of about 50. And Yalfalan's idea, after the death of Stalin in 1953, was to um, create, recreate this tradition, but in a modern sense. So starting in about 1956, 1957, um, there was this um, uh, uh, thaw, which is the word often used for the post stalinist period in terms of censorship of literature and culture. And so during this thought, people like Yao Holan and other poets like Sendor, um, and other people who maybe not everybody will have heard of and so preface we already talked about. But this, this idea was to recreate and revive, revitalize uh, Mongol literature. And so, 30 years later, uh, 30 years later in 1986, Gunu Golastamathan was published, and then uh, Mendoza published Altanawa. And Altanawa, he describes as an almanac. And what is particularly interesting, it's a kind of a cheeky uh, thing that I did in order, in, in, in uh, choosing this as my dissertation topic, it is not so much that I love the book, and I love Mendoza and uh, all, all this, which is true nonetheless. But because this gives a, a kind of focal point for the development of contemporary Mongolian literature. And what Altanova does is to, is to en encapsulate the whole of uh, the tradition of being a Mongol nomad. So one of the first images in this book, actually the first thing is a poem, is, is a poem of praise of Maktal to Yang Chen Hamo. There is the, uh, the Tibetan uh, Saraswati. It's the goddess of music and poetry. But it's um, very much a, a, a Mongol Magtal. And we've heard about Magtal already in the uh, symposium. 
And right at the beginning, after this mic talk, um, we have the image of a stone sitting at the back of Minoyo's family gear on the step of Daniganga. And this stone comes from Atanoa, the, the, the mountain behind the gear. And this stone encapsulates, so this thing, word encapsulates is not chosen by me lightly, because this is the idea of uh, microcosm and macrocosm. So this encapsulation within the stone, sitting at the back of the gear, is of Atanawa. And Atanawa itself, by the Buddhist image of Sumeru, the, 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 the world mountain, the, the axis mundi around which everything revolves. So this is the idea of the book that Atanawa is like the world in miniature. In fact, not a world in miniature, it is the world. But it has bigness, and it, ha it has con contraction and width, too. And, running and this image runs all the way through the book. And so, the eight chapters of this book each deal with an aspect of our traditional Mongol life, horses, the history, um, uh, uh, people like um, Toro Gandhi, who is or kind of like uh, Robin Hood, for those familiar with Robin Hood, can't show any of them, please. Um, uh, popular heroism. So uh, there's Buddhism, there's popular heroes, there's shamanism, there's horses. There's vision, there's myth, there's history. All of these things um, put through the prism of prose and also through the prism of poetry. Menlo is primarily a poet, like most Mongol writers, I think, are by default poets. And when they have a little bit of time, they'll write prose too. But it, it's different from in the West, where most writers, I think, are prose writers who happen maybe occasionally to write poems and less than poets. But poetry is the default literary form in Mongolia. Um, I think primarily because it's uh, a nomadic culture and so you can't carry around books, so you have to have um, a way of remembering the literature that you're writing, so you, so you make it a, a metrical form and an, an alliterative form too. So anyway, the, the, this book is full of poetry and prose and all these different genres, all these different ways, prisms of looking at the world. And what this book does is it, trans, it kind of goes from one part of the century to another. It goes from Memory's childhood and goes into the present day, the present day of 1986. But I think we can extrapolate from that the present day of 2010, or when I first read it, 2005. And what, and what struck me at that point, um, having only just met Memory, what struck me was the, uh, the, the, the consistency of the book. And I think this is really important in terms of Mongol culture. There is a consistency in Mongol culture. It doesn't, it's, it's not an enormously fluid, I mean, it's, a, it's a fluid, but it's not a very changing culture. But within the, within the apparent lack of change that you see, if, if you look at really old literature like the, um, the, the secret history, the Nuttochi, and then you look at maybe Danton Rajo in the 19th century, another very important uh, poet, and Zanabazar maybe, if, you, if, if we have, uh, if we look at it from the point of view of this visual art, and then into the modern world with Yaukhan and Dashpal Bad and then in the modern, modern world, people like Ekaterevan and people like that. that you, 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 get, you get a different perspective on very much the same material. And so there is this consistency within Mongol culture and this consistency within the book. And so I think um, that Atanawa is a, a, a very good way of showing this um, consistency. But also the difference that comes out of one person's uh, perspective. And Menloya's perspective is such that uh, he 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 um, gives the uh, a vision of uh, Mongolia in a very poetic, in a very charged manner. How much time do I have? Um, 
Um, so yes, yeah, so, so he's gi he's giving this um, uh, exposition of, of his Mongolia, but also of, of the traditional nomadic culture of Mongolia through 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 images such as um, such as Torribandi, this um, Robin Hood figure, or or the funeral um, cortege of Chinggis Khan, and how it got stuck. And when it got stuck and it couldn't be moved on, um, the, the local people came and, um, I, I guess, worshipped is not quite the right word, but gave honour, made um, gestures of honour to the body that was on, on the card on, in the funeral cortege. And so that particular place becomes a, a, a point of pilgrimage and a point of focus um, for, for the, for the uh, for the people in, in that area of Daribanga. And um, so then you have also uh, stories of flying horses and of, and of um, orphaned horses wandering around and then finding their herd, finding the right herd for them. So it's, it's, it's also about, um, I think that there, there is a kind of a semi-political message in, in some of these images of the country coming out of the, the uh, of the very difficult um, the the, the the difficult times um, of Mongolia during the Soviet period, and so uh, that, you know you can read this book on many many different levels. But I think what is important for our symposium is that you can also read <coughs> Mongol culture on very many different levels. <coughs> So, for instance, uh, we heard this morning about um, the religious uh, situation in the 19th century, but also in the 20th century, and also in the present day in Sacramento. Um, so, what is this telling us, for instance? And what, what is it telling us to have a uh, band like Thursday <coughs> last night, or um, Sharapwe's um, symphony tonight, or the concerto for modern Ford? What does it tell us? I mean, is, is it simply just syncretic, a um, bunch of syncretic in, uh, ideas? Or is it something different? And I think it may be something different. And I think that the, um, the, way, uh, the, the way in which uh, Mongolia understands its culture is of incredible importance for an understanding of Central Asia. Because, of course, Mongolia stands at the center of Central Asia center of the center, as it were, um, and is a, is a point of passage through a lot of, for, for a lot of literal and figurative uh, trajectories. Like, in, right now, we have a trajectory between Russia and, sorry, Russia and China, for you guys are looking at from that way through, and backwards and forwards. So Mongolia is stuck in the middle between these two increasingly important countries. And how does that how, how does that play out with the music that we're hearing, the music that I presented the other evening in the hip hop tradition, or the non-tradition, the new hip hop tradition that is in Mongolia? How does that work through? How does um, the, uh, the the new ideas of religion work through? How, how does Christianity, which Pat was talking about this morning, how does that um, play out in the new Mongolia? And I, I, I'm not suggesting that all this can be looked through the prism of one book of Artanawa, but I think that Artanawa shows, and the book itself shows, um, not only the consistency, but also the, the uh, breadth of experience that is um, important even now in Mongolia. And what Artanawa does not show is the really modern which, um, I don't know, maybe that's for another one. But I think um, what we can nonetheless take from it uh, is the idea of uh, uh, this new and vibrant, um, creative and economically viable, potentially very viable country and, for instance, the, the contribution of Han Bank in, in promoting and um, encouraging uh, uh, 
artists and, um, and people to, in, uh, to consume, to use a rather vulgar word, but to consume the art is a very powerful thing. And with the, the introduction of the mining and the introduction of um, more interest from abroad, such as what we've been experiencing for the past, past few days, um, writers like Mendoyo and some of the other people, the other younger writers in their 20s and 30s and 40s, um, who, whose work I am translating, and uh, uh, people like Enfero and his colleagues in fine art, and scholars like Orna and so forth. We are going to be producing work that is of, of greater importance, not only to our own small culture of Mongol scholars, but also to a world that is being now defined by the superpowers such as Russia and China. And so, you know, in, in conclusion, because I think we can kind of guess where this may be going, um, in, in conclusion, I think this is a really personally very important symposium, so congratulations to all of us for coming. But I, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of my work, and in terms of understanding culture that we've been doing for the last couple of days, um, this development, these developments and the work that, um, that we as scholars are doing on writers like Memory Art and artists and that sort of thing is a, um, an understanding of how Mongolia fits not only into the world of art but also into the world. And the, the arts today in Mongolia, as we heard from um, Chantsoma, are extremely vibrant. And writers the sort of writers that I translate, their work is extremely different, as you heard from uh, the, the, the poem that Memory and I wrote. You know, it, it's not like Western poetry, but there is something very, very extraordinary about it, and, and a vision and an idea that is salutary and it's different. And it at least make us think about what it's like in another part of the world and how the nomadic community actually deals with being in Mongolia in the present tradition and how the people in the cities relate to the nomadic community too. So in conclusion, although I could go on for many hours and yet, in conclusion I think, you know, uh, th these, th these works are very, very, very important um, for an understanding of Mongol culture but also um, I think uh, within Mongol culture, these these very great differences between um, of, of sort of artistic trajectory are extremely um, um, uh, vibrant and exciting. And um, well, I'd like to thank Mendoyo and all, all the people, all the artists from Mongolia for coming. Um, <coughs> yeah, I've kind of run out of that sentence, but anyway. Um, so th thank you very much. I, I mean, the, 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 these books that I'm producing and the, the art that is being shown is uh, um, really, really significant. And I think you know, this is one thing that we can take from uh, this, this particular panel, the, the vitality of the art and um, the true culture. some information about uh, the three different areas uh, that uh, is related to um, art and culture uh, of our bank. Actually, uh, like I, I'm, I'm probably like the only uh, representative of a business entity here in the group who, uh, which came from uh, all the way from Mongolia. The reason of uh, Orna uh, you know, uh, asking me to participate in this uh, uh, symposium is that uh, since Hanbang is uh, you know strongly supporting the art and culture in uh, Mongolia as well as uh, uh, trying to you know contribute its donation to uh, preserve to uh, protect the traditional art and culture in uh, Mongolia, uh, why don't you just uh, come here and uh, tell about what Hanbang does? And also, like uh, this can be a good uh, contribution that you know the other business entities in Mongolia can. 
you know, uh, do the same as what we are doing. So, uh, what I'm going to talk <coughs> today is that uh, art and culture and harm life, what's the relationship between these two <coughs> aspects? And the second one is uh, harm life art collection, just give you a very brief information about our art collection. And the next one is harm life art gallery, what we do, and you know, like give you some perhaps one or two uh, interesting examples of uh, the art exhibitions and also like uh, some of the projects supported by Hanbeck Foundation especially in the areas of art and culture and also tradition. So just uh, give you a very brief information about uh, Hanbeck. Uh, the bank was established in 1991 as the, under the name of Agricultural Bank and it was uh, purely like uh, established in order to provide the financial services <coughs> financial services to the rural part of Mongolia in the remote areas uh, but also uh, like later on bank was almost like bankrupt uh, at the end of 1999 and 2000 and uh, after that like uh, United States uh, USAID brought American and Mongolian management team to recover this bank uh, so, as of today, we have uh, almost like 500 branches reaching like every single remote municipalities or zones or annex in Mongolia. Also, like uh, it's the biggest bank in Mongolia, which has 4,000 uh, 4, employees, and uh, we provide financial services for to more than like 80% of the uh, Mongolian households and uh, 1.6 million customers, which is out of 2.7. Uh, Median population in Mongolia. Uh, as uh, Orna mentioned to you before, that uh, probably we are the only business entity which has art gallery and also theatre uh, at the head of this building. So this gives us, you know, like a good opportunity that we contribute you know, uh, to the development of art and culture. Also, also like to try to support the art uh, artists or like you know cultural uh, performance. Uh, so, through the art gallery and theatre, we also like you know try to be uh, the one of the good neighbour to every community we serve. So, Han Bank, uh, you know, uh, understands its uh, company social responsibility very well. That's why like uh, we purely aim to you know support the artists through Han Bank Art Gallery, or like to to educate the community, uh, you know, to educate the community or youth through what we are doing, what we are implementing with the art and culture um, areas or art and culture sector performance. So, uh, Hanbank Art Collection, it's an interesting history that, you know, after the USA management, <coughs> I'm sorry, American and Mongolian management team, uh, which started back in 2000, uh, the CEO uh, of Han Bank at that time, who's called Mr. Peter Morrow, decided to uh, support artists uh, in Mongolia through, uh, in a way that uh, tried to, you know, bank purchases some of their work, so that you know, like it was the time that uh, Mongolian artists uh, were not really in in a good uh, position to sell their art, like no. Non, uh, almost like none of the business entities bought their art. So uh, he initiated that and uh, asked for a professional creator who's uh, Orna here. And Pete and Orna together, they have started you know, buying some really good pieces of uh, art from the artists. So uh, as of today, we've got uh, almost like 300 art uh, work, including paintings, sculptures, calligraphies, and graphic art. And, uh, so on. So, over the years, you know, like every year we put some budget into our financial like uh, uh, budget to buy, you know, a certain number of uh, art in order to expand the collection. So, as I mentioned to you, like uh, with the help <coughs> of our owner, we have, uh, you know, managed to by uh, or that managed to support uh, many artists in Mongolia, and this gives a great opportunity that you know, starting from uh, 
2003, 2004, you know, other business entities, other individuals started to purchase uh, in a way exactly how we did. So that means, you know, like uh, business entities started to understand how important it is to have an art collection and how wonderful it is to have an art collection in, in, the, in the business areas. So that, you know, that it, it gives a great opportunity for the employees who are working in that of business organizations to, you know, get some education or get some feeling from those art work. So, Hanbank Art Gallery, we have established, uh, when we moved to the new head office building, in 2007, we uh, found uh, that there is a good space that we can <coughs> use it for Hanbank Art Gallery. So established it in December 2007, and the first exhibition was uh, an exhibition that uh, uh, sh you know to display the calligraphic uh, calligraphies of uh, Mr. Mindoyo. So he was our first uh, like exhibitor, along with uh, several different young calligraphers. Uh, so, as you can see on the screen, uh, in that old Mongolian transcript, it says Han Bang, that Mr. Mindoyo did. <coughs> so, uh, since 2007, we have uh, successfully had like more than 40 exhibitions. And again, like here, uh, you can see the work, which uh, has been you know, drawn by uh, Inchtev, the presenter just before me. Uh, just to give you some understanding about, uh, or like uh, just one or two examples of uh, the uh, art exhibitions, uh, over the years we have received like application forms from the artists that uh, how they want to you know, uh, have the exhibitions. And uh, it was not only the Mongolian artists, it was like international projects that we have implemented in uh, our Han Art Gallery. Just one of the examples is that um, in 2008, uh, we had, no, sorry, it was 2009, we had, uh, 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 so if I go to the capitalist art, you know, Hanbeck Art Gallery gives an opportunity to the artists to have uh, their exhibitions free of charge, and then we carry out the APR, we do the APR, as well as, you know, we do the opening ceremony, and we welcome the artists to have different forums, different symposiums, workshops in the uh, art gallery during the exhibition. So this capitalist art, uh, it was a very interesting one that uh, Orna implemented and it attracted great amount of uh, like, uh, interest uh, by the Mongolian, not only like art and culture and community, but also like the public. Uh, basically like uh, in 1968, the first exhibition of young artists opened in the exhibition hall of UMA. Uh, but later on, you know, like uh, from this exhibition, several of the work by four different uh, artists uh, were found out that they are, you know, they, they, their work was in a way of capitalist art. So they just, you know, closed the exhibition and, you know, the four artists were, uh, like, had very difficult time of, from, from what they drew. So later on, you know, like this, uh, their work was closed since, uh, since uh, 1968, and after 40 years, it was first time to be displayed or to be uh, able to be displayed to the public. So it was the uh, exhibition called Capitalist Art to you know show the Mongolian intellectual life and also like you know to display forgotten uh, you know never shown works since. Uh, like 60s to the Mongolian audience that every Mongolian woman would have. But like one day, this uh, uh, several different people came in, just you know, like cut her hair, and you know, it was probably like a great shock for those people to experience those. And people were asked to, uh, you know, not to use the veils anymore. They were asked to use the Western type of clothes and so on. So all of these were within the minds of the people, but it was not really well recorded. So uh, this uh, project was uh, with the Cambridge University was aimed to listen to those uh, old people and then try to you know, uh, record it so that oral history of, of 20th century, uh, sorry it says 21st, it's 20th century, 
Uh, just the next project is research of traditional folk art in uh, remote Mongolia, uh, the western part of Mongolia. Uh, you know, studying the Gomi traditional folk art, uh, which has been preserved by people or by, by families. The next project was, uh, you know, we worked with the modern art gallery in Ulaanbaatar to establish or to uh, develop a virtual, virtual art gallery, it's more like digital art gallery, the funds of the modern art gallery into a digital form and to have it in their website. And it was a great successful project that uh, since, uh, as we had this, this uh, a big fire in 2008 that uh, we destroyed some of the, uh, we lost some of the art. So we decided, okay, such kind of like, uh, uh, you know, bad things may happen in the future. That's why like, it's better to have digital art collection of the modern art gallery to preserve them. So, just uh, one little last project is was called like Rainbow Horses, where uh, we implemented in 2006. It was aimed to, you know, make these little horses, little cute horses, by the artists, and then ask the kids of different schools to paint them. And you know, we display those in different uh, you know uh, art institutes. And up until now, you know, it was it's a very cute horses that business entities, for example, like one of the big television in Mongolia, they display outside the office building, and they, anybody who's passing over can see those little horses. That's more or less what we uh, you know do, and uh, some of the information about our projects. And uh, just as, an, as a conclusion, Hamburg feels uh, you know, strongly positive about uh, art and culture and development, successful de development of the art and culture in Mongolia. And we will uh, continue supporting the art and culture in Mongolia, especially try to preserve uh, the traditional art and culture uh, to the young generation, to the next generations. Thank you. very sensitive issue of business and art um, as um, uh, it's increasingly very important for continuation of tradition and uh, not only the practices but also the scholarship, uh, the scholarship and the funding and as Simon mentioned the introduction of mining of course those industries bring profits but how to, to create a channel where that profit also goes to arts and culture and scholarship, this is one of the issues that the country is dealing with. So um, the example that currently Hambang is giving is important, but at the same time, um, it's uh, still open question whether they will be continuing it. Um, I do hope that they will, but it's not still, um, it's still opening, it's opening the air. Um, and uh, currently I'm not involved with Hang Bank at all um, and I do <coughs> hope that Hang Bank will be sort of um, uh, not only continuing but also continue to be involved for in um, bridging art and business. Um, so let's uh, um, open the floor for the questions and uh, hope uh, we can have some discussion. I'm getting a, a, a feeling for the connection between old and new uh, with regard to poetry. And unfortunately, I, would, I couldn't be here earlier, so I don't know what might have been said about the continuity of the art. But from the talk on, on the temperament of art, it seems that, uh, that there is very much an individual influence like there is in this country. With regard to with regard to themes or with regard to compositions, uh, how how the painting is done, uh, what what the connection is between old and new, or individual. Uh,
actually wrote poetry, arts. Yeah, the poetry I can, I'm, I'm beginning to see that, uh, the connection of the old and the new, and the, the poetry, the, uh, the metricality, the literary, the, uh, the, uh, the subject matter. Uh, it's very easy to see how that, uh, the emphasis on nature that, that as it exists in Mongolia, it's very easy to see the connection between that modern poetry visual arts. Uh, they, they looked at, the, at the, the photographs of the art in the art the, the, from the bank art, the bank gallery. Uh, you, you saw a very individualistic uh, styles uh, and, and subject matter. Some of it could have been straight from Visual art, old and new, as opposed to the Yeah, we're, we're all saying it's a question to everyone, right? It's everyone. a question probably to you because you're the art historian. I agree what um, Simon said that about the vibrancy of art in, in Mongolia, in every um, genre, whether it's poetry, literature, music, um, film, um, visual arts, it's very vibrant and very dynamic. And uh, um, there are a lot of very strong, um, colorful experimentations um, in terms of subject matter, in terms of um, um, pure um, techniques, technical in terms of theme. Um, what you see here in Bank, um, we started with very um, prominent, what we thought a very prominent part of Mongolian art at the time, 2001. And we were very glad to see that those artists became very internationally acclaimed throughout these years. Um, more than four, four or five of them are internationally uh, recognized. And uh, it's impossible to um, buy the art anymore at that high level. But uh, as you see, also um, one of interests of the bank, because it, it started as an agricultural bank, it, it was sort of um, tried to change that image, and um, there was very strong interest in modern art. And so <clears throat> the reason also I, I got involved because I, my work is at the time period was very strongly about modern art. And the collection contains purely um, the art of modern, uh, modernism and uh, uh, variety of artists. Um, and that, that, that is very much expanding. Um, um, that was expanded the last um, uh, generation of young artists was in 2000, was added in 2010, last year. Um, but the variety of styles and um, um, this is sort of um, also dependent on the background of education, such as, for instance, students of Engtal will be producing a very different work from the student of young artists. And that was also my interest to show in this exhibition that is in the courtyard, is to show those differences, uh, not only in terms of themes and techniques, but um, there are different types of concepts going on. And um, it's not only the connection between new and old, but it's, I see it as a kind of very um, um, strong, challenging struggle of finding yourself, essentially, because it's a country of, of recovery. Um, we all have been gone through this socialist education, socialist upbringing. I myself, I grew up in a country which was anti-Buddhist, but I came to Berkeley to study Buddhism. 
parent, this kind of things. It's in everybody's life, something like that is happening. We're kind of trying to find ourselves. And in this recovery process, it's very visible in visual arts. And every artist, I think, is those dynamics of search, dynamics of experimentation, dynamics of self-identity, is of kind of expressed in very multifarious ways. And um, it's not <coughs> that approach that we see Western art here. Western art is mostly it's a crit critical statement of the society, it's a critical statement of some problems, or um, it's more it's conceptual. Here, it's a, a, I, from my perspective, many artists in Mongolia uh, is a search for identity and a search for what is really I, how is the roots are connecting, how the roots are, are, must be or should be brought to, to, the, to the modernity. So at the time I lived, it was the end of the classical nomadic life, way of life in Mongolia. So uh, I feel that uh, responsibility or I feel like I have to preserve that values of the traditional nomadic life that Mongols used to live. So I, I try from my heart to to do my best in this in this way. There is uh, one interesting thing then if you uh, start doing a little research into the backgrounds of a new generation of poets in Mongolia and as he says uh, most of them come uh, out of countryside. So even if uh, young people live in the cities, it doesn't take long. It will take a couple of minutes just to get out of the city to the countryside and see the nomadic life. But at the same time, there are people who just grew up in cities and is uh, working, uh, doing the poetry, writing the poetry. Uh, and there are a lot of young uh, poets who especially write in avant-garde or in modern style. Last 15-20 years it was very popular in Mongolia actually to follow the steps of Western poetry, Westernized style, using the Westernized style. <coughs> so they were against the traditional uh, forms of poetry. Uh, 
but when they grow up and become more uh, uh, more advanced in their writings, we can see that again they go back to the traditional forms or traditional poetry and trying to combine the two styles, Western and modern style of uh, traditional Mongolian poetry. Yeah. So even when we were uh, speaking about the uh, past of the Mongolian uh, poetry, it's still very new to, to the outside world. Because like 20 years ago, it wasn't even unknown to the uh, outside uh, Mongolia. So, My question was that um, in the last decade, um, many Mongols have come to the United States, especially in the area, and um, many students and um, newborns are born in the United States. And I was asking Ian Doyo that how he feels about this, and I was curious about that loss of uh, culture. <laughs> It's an interesting question, and but I wanted to continue what I was uh, telling. <laughs> so, my understanding that people who grew up in cities they don't uh, don't have as bigger or uh, richer vocabulary uh, as it was used to be before like we used to uh, know and use the rules that would describe the dawn, sunrise, and dawn, and we had seven different words uh, we used for that. So just just before uh, sunrise, the dawn, we have five, six, seven different words to uh, to describe each moment of that process, and we used to use it in in, in everyday life. So today, today's kids probably would use just just one word, sunrise. So the main uh, difficulties for new poets is just lack of the words to, to express themselves. And because of that, they have to choose the modern style, which is very uh, different from the tradition. So, 
ингэжчихсэн учраас тэд нэр юм шүүхэд одоо тийм ч бас шин зүйл болж харагддаггүй л дээ. But because uh, everybody reads uh, western modernist modern poetry it doesn't uh, look you know very new for for us when we read mongolian modernists. Тэгэхээр тэд нэр эргээд одоо улам жил дээр байгаа өөрийнхөө одоо оюуны үгсийн одоо тоцоолын санд нэмэгдүүлэхээр одоо шаргуу одоо шиж эхэлж байна. So this is the reason why they have to go back to traditional culture and traditional poetry to get more out of it and use in their uh, uh, art in their poetry. Чи одоо би Америкт одоо өсөөд энэ суралцж байгаа одоо одоо англи хэлээр одоо унган одоо англи хэлтэй болж байгаа бол ч одоо нэг талаас уу одоо сайн за гэхдээ Монгол одоо хэлээр энэ одоо заавал одоо яддаг уншдаг одоо маг их хэлний одоо тэр байлаг санаа so uh, it's good that uh, 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 Mongolians are living here and learning English and uh, uh, getting educated here. But I want at the same time to uh, to say uh, and wish them to learn Mongolian and spend more time learning about their culture and poetry. Uh, for example, my grandson is good at his uh, high school student here. Yeah, take it. We do that on your student and the tongue of the source and the tongue of 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 the tongue uh, started uh, writing uh, poetry, but now he's uh, for, for now he's using English for that. And uh, he thinks uh, that uh, the Buddha needs to learn Mongolian and learn how to write poetry in Mongolian. So I uh, always send him Mongolian books to read. Ах тосон оюун сэтгэл зүрх энэ дуу дээр Монгол тосон байгаа учраас Монголоороо одоо үн шатууд эргээд одоо Монголын өрөө болон сэтгэлгээ бий болгоход таанаад маш анхаа нөгөө одоо хичээл хэвчээ because you have the blood of mongolians because you have the background it would be easy for yes the people 20 years younger than me have much less language or an understanding of the natural world and are consequently a lot further away from having, except for from a scientific point of view, an understanding of how to take care of it or really live with it. And one of the things I've been thinking about, and this is just for you to respond to, um, in some ways I see Paul asking that people grow up writing about and writing about uh, about the natural world is a way to make people pay attention to it. In a way, in your case, to pay attention to how you traditionally interact with the natural world, because you're going to have to protect it. You know, if, you're, if your country's going anywhere the way that most of the Western <coughs> countries are going, it, if you're going to have to, poetry might be a really powerful way to protect it. In the United States after the war, and I mean, I'm not from the United States, that's not evidently, but um, I think that what's happening in Mongolia is, as he says, is a kind of a repositioning of wor working out the relationship between the city and the countryside. And where I live in Seattle, of course, that is the place where Gary Snyder started to write. And I think his work there's a very interesting set of papers or even maybe a dissertation or a thesis waiting to be written comparing a writer like Gary Snyder, who is maybe 20 years older than him, maybe a little younger, um, Gary Snyder's work with Henry's work, because they are both seeking the same type of understanding of nature, I think. And the way in which Gary Snyder's work and, and writing
going to open up to Thomas Berry and Wendell Holmes and people like that. The people like that, um, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, um, I, I, I think there are parallels. And I think what's going to happen is that uh, the understanding will come. But I think, in my experience of going to Mongolia and of talking to writers, um, some of them are faster than others. And, the, and also the understanding that they have is different from the understanding of the generation I remember yourself. And so, just like modern people, my generation and younger, have a, a new relationship with the landscape. And a new relationship with Part of a generation that grew up still understanding, still with some kind of feet in the nomadic world, uh, or the, the world view of there. And uh, but you've you've spent much of your life in the city. I'm wondering about the, the next generations of poets and writers who maybe grew up in the city, uh, for whom is this traditional world view, Simon, that you're talking about here, this way of understanding tradition and seeing continuity, is that almost like a foreign language for them? They're Mongolian, uh, uh, but uh, they're clearly, I'm wondering how much of the old world or the, sort of the other way of seeing things, the other perspectives, can still be there if they're raised in the city. Yeah. Is that for you? I'm going to throw it out there. It's uh, true that there is a disconnect between younger generation and the uh, uh, and the real life or. For example, it happened even in with our generation, because in the 1940s in Mongolia they went from old Mongolian script to Cyrillic script. So this was something that uh, influenced. All, all, all generation. I wanted to be a poet and write a poetry, but uh, all traditional uh, classical Mongolian poetry uh, was written on another script. But my father used uh, to take me uh, to the countryside and we were walking, he used a stick to write the letters, Mongolian script letters, on a snow or on a uh, land, so that way I learned Mongolian script. So when I was uh, studying the literature, I used to spend uh, half of my time spending in the uh, in the libraries reading Mongolian script that is wasn't included in in my uh, 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 right. So there would be challenges for every generation, so we have to find out uh, to build your own strategies 
how to overcome those challenges and find the ways. For example, uh, in Mongolia, just over 2 million uh, people live in Mongolia, but in the last uh, 20, 50 years, half of the population moved to the cities. So it's the, another challenge for for but I don't think it will continue forever. With a new uh, technology coming in, people would go, uh, eventually would go back to the countryside using their cell phones, using their 